It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, yesterday the Premier announced that pharmacies will start testing people with COVID symptoms, as well as close contacts of people who are COVID positive. While this announcement might be great for shoppers and for corporate bottom lines, everyday Ontarians are worried. Pharmacies need to be safe for seniors, immunocompromised people, and parents of unvaccinated kids, who all deserve to get their prescription and their flu shots without fear of being exposed to COVID. Sending symptomatic people who may have COVID into a pharmacy is a bad idea. Speaker, will the Premier admit that this is the wrong move and pause this new program? To reply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. And I can assure the member and the people of Ontario that pharmacies will continue to be safe. We are expanding testing uh, for both symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals in our pharmacies. This has been recommended by Dr. Moore, our Chief Medical Officer of Health, and his uh, medical experts at Public Health Ontario. And I can assure the member that the pharmacies, as they always have, will be following strict infection prevention and control measures. But we need to make sure that we have testing venues open for people, especially with the holidays approaching. As we're opening up more of Ontario, there may be more people that need to be tested. Pharmacies have been trusted partners in this, and I'm sure they will do this with their usual level of precaution and safety to make sure that everyone is safe that enters the pharmacy. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I can tell the minister that not all medical experts agree that this is a good decision. The Premier said that he would never go ahead uh, with COVID measures that weren't in people's best health interests. That has clearly, however, not been the case in this pandemic. The Premier promised to build an iron ring around long-term care, but those protections were never put in place. He closed playgrounds for children last spring. He's constantly delayed taking decisive action so so much so that ICUs have filled up and thousands of surgeries were postponed. Speaker, can the Premier tell Ontarians why we are shifting gears now to COVID testing in pharmacies and how he can justify this decision? Mr. Health. Thank you. Well, I can assure the member opposite that all participating pharmacies are expected to implement and follow strict infection prevention and control measures to protect staff patients and other customers, of course, against COVID-19. And it's important, especially with the holidays approaching, because not everyone has a, an assessment facility or another facility to go for testing. We need to make sure that there are going to be convenient places to go and that the, all of the important infection measures will be followed. So we know that in rural Ontario, northern Ontario especially, this is, is a, a problem for assessment facilities, but not for pharmacies. Most organizations in most towns have pharmacies available. But it's important to remember that the infection prevention and control measures that we've always followed, like a dedicated space to perform specimen collection, physical distancing, time between appointments to Response. allow for cleaning and to avoid lineups, and wearing masks inside pharmacies. All of these precautions will be taken to make sure that everyone is healthy and safe. And the final supplementary. We all know where this Premier normally gets his advice, from big corporate lobbyists and Conservative Party insiders, Order. always. These are the Premier's buddies who gave him, for example, the advice to put big box stores instead of small businesses. They also wanted him to pave over wetlands for even more warehouses. Speaker, Ontarians deserve to have safe pharmacies, and people with COVID symptoms de deserve to get tested in facilities that are purposefully designed with proper infection prevention and control protections. Will the Premier tell us which of his buddies asked him to change the rules in ways that could jeopardize the health of Ontarians? Minister of Health. Our chief measure since the beginning of this pandemic has been to protect the health and safety of all Ontarians. That continues to be the case. And the only buddy that we have received information from is our Chief Medical Officer here, here, of Health, here, Dr. Kieran. That's who we follow. And the people of Public Health Ontario, their epidemic
epidemiologists, they know what's safe, and they have indicated that this is going to be safe. There are going to be strict measures, which I've already indicated. There's also going to require signage outside the pharmacy and an online listing of participating pharmacies. This will be safe. This needs to be something that is open for everyone in Ontario who feels that they have some symptoms, they need to be tested, and it will be done with the usual precautions and safety that pharmacies have always used throughout this. They have been major partners with us in terms of testing, in terms of vaccination, in terms of flu vaccinations that are coming forward. They have been great partners in the work that we're doing. But the only advice that we receive on what we should be doing comes from Dr. Moore and the doctors who are advising him. Question, the member for University Rosedale. Ontarians know exactly why families and children do not have a childcare deal. The Premier himself is involved. It's no wonder we are the last province without affordable childcare for families. Because this government doesn't want to make a deal to lower childcare fees, this government doesn't want to make a deal to provide more high quality and affordable childcare spaces. It doesn't want to make a deal to ensure better wages and training for staff. And it doesn't want to make a deal to ensure women can keep working and grow our economy. So my question is to the Premier. What about the federal childcare offer is the Premier saying no to? Mr. Education. Mr. Speaker, we want a fair deal for Ontario families. What we oppose, what we say no to, is a program that never gets to $10 a day, which is the commitment the federal Liberals made to the people of this province. And we insist, as progressive Conservatives, that they deliver on their commitment for $10 for all families in this province. In the absence of getting to $10, it is not a deal that we believe is in the interest of families, because they're shortchanging our province. We know that because, at best, at best, at maturity in year five, the program gets at $21. How is it that the NDP and the Liberals are comfortable with Ontarians paying more than every province east and west of us? We want to get that deal. We support affordable childcare. It's why this government announced a plan to reduce childcare costs opposed by the NDP and opposed by the Liberals. We're going to continue to work with the federal government to land a deal That's that reduces prices, that ensures flexibility, and is sustainable for decades to come. Uh, back to the Premier, what is very clear is that Ontario families today pay the highest childcare fees in the country, east and west of us, right now. That's, that's the no-deal situation we have right now. One of the biggest barriers to childcare is how unaffordable it is. For many families, it's even more expensive than a mortgage. Building affordable $10 a day childcare would make a huge difference for families. If we had affordable childcare now, families could afford better housing and food instead of maxing out their credit card every month. That's right. Parents in other provinces have said it's been life-changing. BC and Alberta's fees will fall next year, and Quebec knows the program pays for itself with a great return on every dollar invested. My question to the Premier is, when will this government give us affordable $10 a day, high-quality non-profit and public childcare? Mr. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. We do agree childcare is too expensive in this province. It was an inherited legacy of the former Liberal government. We're under the Daljica win Liberals. Childcare rose by 40 per cent above the, per the national average. Unacceptable. It's why in the first budget of this government we introduced a child care tax credit. It's why the Minister of Finance and the Premier enriched it in the last budget. But we know there's more to do. The Feds contribute 2.5 per cent. Obviously, they should be doing much, much more. We're, we're working with the federal government to make the case, like Quebec, which the member opposite cited, who had a program in place and was fully supported and subsidized accordingly with no strings attached. We want the same type of deal for Ontario's program for four- and five-year-olds, for a quarter of a million children that have the best quality care in schools, led by a teacher and an ECE. We want that recognized. We don't want to be penalized in this province for doing more than the rest of the Federation. We want that recognized. What? We want a fair program, and we want something that's going to endure the test of time, a program that reduces fees for decades to come. Final supplementary. Thank you. Back to the Premier. It is important to also recognize that under this Ontario government's three-year tenure, childcare fees have gone up, not down. 
Yesterday, Carolyn Ferns from the Ontario Coalition for Better Childcare said it extremely clearly. She said parents don't want to hear any more excuses from this Premier or from this Minister of Education because it is very clear kindergarten is not childcare. The money the federal government has put on the table was never meant to pay for kindergarten. It's meant to pay for Ontario families to get more help for childcare. All we have been hearing from this government are delays and distractions from what is really a very important and critical question. Will this Premier stop negotiating in the media and get Ontario families $10 a day childcare now? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. We agree that childcare is too expensive. It rose by 40 per cent under the former Liberal government, and there's much to do in this respect. It's why we're working with the federal government to get a deal, a good deal, a fair deal for the people of this province. As provincial legislators, our duty is to stand up for Ontario families, for children, to the national government, and suggest that the program they put in place is insufficient, is not flexible, and ultimately, under no scenario in year one nor year five, gets us to $10 a day. That's why we're standing up with the intent of landing a deal that is better, and we would hope every member of this House would agree that we should be able to extract a better deal for the people of this province. And In fact, you mentioned a quote from one stakeholder. I want to note to the member that the executive director of the Association of Daycare Operators of Ontario said, and I quote, the wrong deal for Ontario could lead families with fewer licensed childcare spaces and paying much, much more for them, end quote. We're going to stay at the table, get a good deal that reduces costs, and ensure childcare is sustainable for decades to come. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Speaker, we're just weeks away now from an approval for the COVID-19 vaccine for 5 to 11-year-olds. Parents, meanwhile, are still waiting to see a plan. The science table said we need a clear information campaign, school-based clinics, and an equity-based strategy to reach those at-risk communities. But we haven't seen any of this from this government. Nothing. Nothing. Meanwhile, provincial data show that vaccination rates for the 12 to 17-year-old group are lagging behind. Speaker, we cannot afford to get this wrong. When will the minister stop asking parents to just trust her and show people an actual plan to get kids the protection of a vaccine? Minister Hill. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. In fact, a great deal of work has already been done uh, on the vaccination of children aged 5 to 11 because we anticipate that there will be approval very soon from Health Canada, and the vaccines are all ready to go, and we are ready to provide them. We have been working, Dr. Moore and his team have been working with their 34 local medical officers of health for the delivery of vaccines within their communities. This information will be available very shortly to parents because I do understand that parents want to know what's going to be happening in their local geographic area. We do know that parents of young children that are five to approximately seven years of age would like their children to be vaccinated either by their family uh, physician or pediatrician, whereas for older children, uh, the parents may are happier if they could be uh, vaccinated perhaps at pharmacies or at larger vaccination clinics or perhaps pop-up clinics. There is a detailed plan in place for each geographic area. That is going to be forthcoming very soon to answer parents' questions. Supplementary question. Premier, back to uh, actually, uh, Minister Speaker, I'll, I'll send this back to the minister. Uh, the minister says that they're ready to, to deliver this vaccine plan. Well, tell that to the parents who don't know where to register their kids yet. Public health units are doing great work, but the government is dithering and dathering and delaying, and anti vax activists are filling that silence. We're risking losing people to misinformation. Families in British Columbia, on the other hand, have been able to pre-register their kids since early October, giving them incredible peace of mind and early information to prepare themselves and their children. As of last week, over 70,000 children in British Columbia had pre-registered for the shot. Where are we? Speaker, why won't the government take this simple step and get things moving so we can all get out of this pandemic sooner? Government side will come to order. Minister of Health to reply. 
Thank you. In fact, we are ready to go. We have a, in a very good state of readiness. We have had detailed discussions with the local medical officers of health and with Dr. Moore over the last several months to be prepared because this isn't just a simple matter. We want to make sure that we can prioritize to the five to seven year olds. We also need to make sure that we, five to 11 year olds, pardon me. We also need to make sure that we're able to do the third shots for people who are over 70, immunocompromised people and the rest of it. All of this is organized. All of this is going to be communicated by the local 34 public health units very shortly so that parents can start pre-registering their children, making appointments with their family doctors, because the plan is going to be different in each of those units depending on where they are, whether a school is going to be the more convenient location to vaccinate children, uh, not during school hours, but when their parents can be Response. with them. We have a plan. It is going to be communicated very shortly and is going to be provided in due course for parents to be able to make their own arrangements that they see appropriate for their own child. But we are ready to move immediately on this. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question today is to the Honourable Minister of Infrastructure. For far too long, Ontario's small and larger rural and northern communities have been struggling to address their critical infrastructure needs that would provide residents with safe, modernized and accessible services. The Liberals knew about these struggles and concerns for 15 years and did absolutely nothing to address them. The most these communities ever got from the past government was an acknowledgement that an infrastructure backlog existed and some proposed additional funding as a last-minute attempt to gain traction in the last provincial election. Speaker, Ontarians Order. deserve a government that listens to these communities, and now more than ever, they need a government that says yes instead of a chorus of no. So to the minister, through you, Speaker. What is the government's plan to support Ontario's small, rural and northern communities to address these critical infrastructure Question. backlogs? Minister of Infrastructure to respond. Much and, uh, thank you to the member for raising this very important issue. I know that everyone in this chamber can agree that communities are the heartbeat of this province. Our government recognizes this, and that's why we're working with our municipal partners to address their infrastructure backlog. The member is absolutely correct in saying our government is committed to building Ontario. This commitment is emphasized in our recent fall economic statement, where we announced an additional $1 billion over the next five years for our 424 small, rural and northern communities. That's an additional $200 million per year, which will go a long way in supporting these communities' repair, rebuild roads, bridges, water and wastewater treatment plants. Our government is saying yes to new, improved hospitals, yes to new, improved long-term care facilities, yes to building highways and public Lots. transit, and yes to helping our municipal partners address their infrastructure needs. The supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for your response, and I couldn't agree more. I know this funding will go a long way for the residents of Mississauga and communities across the province. Even the Ontario Chamber of Commerce called on the previous Liberal government in 2016, nearly two years before the 2018 provincial election, asking them to step up and start investing in vital infrastructure projects to support building and repairing transit, roads and bridges throughout the province. The Liberal government either didn't hear these calls or just didn't care enough to support the crucial infrastructure that the people of Ontario needed and deserved. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister of Infrastructure, what is our government doing to support communities like Mississauga and address our critical infrastructure needs? Minister of Infrastructure. I want to thank the very hardworking member from Mississauga for a question. Mr. Speaker, I can assure the people of Ontario that our government is taking action to support communities across the province, from Kenora to Sarnia and from Sault Ste. Marie to Ottawa. We are prioritizing investments in vital infrastructure. Through increased OSIF funding beginning in 2022, eligible communities will see their minimum annual funding go from 50,000 to 100,000. On top of this, Mr. Speaker, our government continues to support critical infrastructure investments in urban settings, such as building hospitals in Brampton and in Ottawa. 
building long-term care homes faster than ever before in Ajax, in Toronto, and in Mississauga, where the demand is the greatest, building subways in the city of Toronto and in York Region, and building new schools in Oshawa and in Pickering. Collectively, we are spending over $145 billion over the next decade to ensure Ontarians are healthy, Ontarians are strong, Response. and our province is more resilient in the future. The next question, the member for Hamilton West, and Castor Dundas. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Uh, the Premier's low-wage policies and lack of action to tackle the affordability crisis are making things harder for every Ontarian. But that's not all that this government is doing to make things worse. A new article by the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternative reports that for the next two years, cuts in the form of spending shortfalls will take a bite out of health care. The CCPA projects that, compared to what's actually needed just to maintain current health care services, which we all know are already lacking, the health care sector will be short $3 billion. After all, our province has gone through in this pandemic. Why is this government shortchanging our health care system by $3 billion? Good. Mr. Bell. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Uh, in fact, what's happened is we've put massive amounts of money into our health care system. First of all, hundreds of millions of dollars in order to make sure that we can, first of all, keep the lights on. Secondly, that we can deal with the effects of COVID, with the testing, with the vaccinations, with all the keeping the assessment centers open, all of the rest. We've put over half a billion dollars into making sure that we can keep going with the surgeries that had to be postponed during COVID when we had vast numbers of people in intensive care. We've created 3,000 more hospital beds as a result. This happens because we are in investing in our health care system. We know we need to be ready for people for COVID and after COVID because we're facing a huge mental health need across the province as well. So rather than uh, uh, lessening our uh, investitures in health care, we're increasing them significantly. Speaker, uh, from the Minister of Health saying that their goal is just to keep the lights on in hospitals is not very reassuring at all because people's experience are so much worse. Thousands of side, come to order. are still waiting for surgery and diagnostic services, but with projected shortcomings, Ontarians will face even longer waits and more delays for the health care procedures that they need and that they deserve. This government would rather cut corners and shortchange our health care system than get people the knee surgeries, the cancer screenings that they need to live a healthy life. The CCPA, CCPA says this poor health care planning will result in real cuts to public services at the level of individuals and families, and people are feeling those cuts already. Why would this premier introduce a fall economic statement with painful cuts to health care, especially after a global pandemic? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Speaker. First, Speaker, through you, there are two things that I would like to clarify. First is what I said was that hospitals need to have these increases to keep the lights on and to do the work that they need to do, not just to keep the lights on. There's a big difference there. And secondly, uh, it also needs to be noted that we have increased our funding by hundreds of millions of dollars into health care, particularly dealing with the issue that the member just mentioned in order to continue with the surgeries and procedures that were postponed during COVID. We've put over half a billion dollars into our hospitals to allow them to do that. We've also launched a surgical innovation fund of over $30 million to allow individual hospitals to make some small changes to what they're doing so that they can increase those surgeries, increase those procedures. We want to make sure that we take care of the health and welfare of everyone in Ontario, not I shouldn't say not just the people with COVID, that's very important, but with everyone else too, because I know that many people are waiting for hip and knee replacements. Response. It's costly, it's very painful for them, but they've been waiting long enough. We are there to protect the health and safety of all Ontarians. The next question, member for Orleans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs. Uh, Speaker, November is Women's Abuse Prevention Month in Ontario. Now, about a year ago, I stood in this chamber to call attention to the disturbing actions of a member of Ottawa City Council towards women who he worked with for many years and harassed for many years. The City of Ottawa's Integrity Commissioners found that the councillor had committed inappropriate and sexually charged behaviour in the workplace. 
He stated that these are incomprehensible incidents of harassment. Now, the city took the strongest measures possible, which was to suspend his pay for 450 days. He just started getting paid again last weekend, Mr. Speaker. But during that time, he continued to build his pension. He continued, and he will receive a, a severance if he chooses not to run in next fall or, or loses his re-election. Any other Ontario resident would have lost their job for what this member of City Council uh, did in the workplace. My bill, uh, Bill 10, stopping harassment and abuse by local leaders, would is on the order paper right now and would provide a solution to this problem, Mr. Speaker. We're running out of time to get the legislation okay. passed. Will the government commit to supporting Bill 10? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks Speaker. Uh, through you to the honourable member, our, our government has been absolutely clear that we will not tolerate workplace harassment or discrimination of any type. Heads of council and members of council need to carry out their duties in an ethical and responsible manner. And I want to thank the honourable member for his advice and feedback as part of our consultation. I want to also thank uh, the member for Niagara Centre. Uh, and I want to acknowledge the work that uh, Minister Dunlop and Minister McKenna has done as part of the consultation. Uh, AMO has given us uh, very valuable feedback on this file. We take this file very seriously uh, as we move forward, and I'll have more to say uh, in the coming weeks on the matter. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, this egregious behaviour isn't limited to Ottawa. There are similar cases in Brampton and in Barrie today as we speak, and undoubtedly, Mr. Speaker, throughout history there have been many, many more. As I understand it, AMO supports stronger integrity measures, including measures that would allow for the removal of an elected municipal official from office for such behaviours. Municipalities facing these, these circumstances have exhausted the tools at their disposal. They can withdraw pay. That's it. The women in Ottawa who have come forward have shown great courage and resilience to share their stories and help shed light on this issue. As I mentioned before, Mr. Speaker, we are running out of time to get legislation passed. If the government won't support Bill 10, when will they introduce their own legislation so we can finally address this issue? Minister, Ms. Speaker, I want to thank the uh, member for the question, and I, I concur. Um, uh, the women that have come forward have been very brave and very courageous, and we take uh, their comments uh, about what happened very, very seriously. Um, the member opposite also talked about the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. Uh, again, I want to thank them. They've recommended increased financial penalties, suspension uh, of members for certain violations, removal from office uh, in circum circum certain circumstances, and, and better training and standards for integrity commissioners. And I think those recommendations are, are very, very valuable. We appreciate all of the feedback that uh, the ministers heard during the consultation, but I want to make the House uh, very clear on our uh, approach going forward. We will ensure that our municipal partners have the resources and the tools that they need to foster safe and respectful workplaces. Thank you for the question. Next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, like all members of this House, I took the time this past Remembrance Day to reflect upon the sacrifices made by the brave men and women who served our country. Recently, Speaker, I heard a shocking statistic. It's estimated that there could be as many as 5,000 military veterans in Canada experiencing homelessness. This is far too many, Speaker. Veterans not only deserve our respect, but they also deserve the support of our government. Right. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House what the government is doing to address this issue and honour our veterans? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank uh, uh, the member for his uh, tireless work and advocacy for our veterans. Uh, veterans who uh, stepped up to serve our country deserve a place to call home. And that's why I was so pleased to be in uh, Kingston last week uh, with Kingston Mayor Brian Patterson and Homes for Heroes as we announced that our government will be providing up to $2 million to help build up to 25 tiny homes as part of a veterans village for military veterans ex experiencing homelessness. The province is working, as I said, in partnership with the City of Kingston and with the Homes for Heroes Foundation uh, uh, to uh, convert a portion of the uh, Kingston Provincial Campus into that veterans village. Each uh, veterans village 
uh, will be constructed from a prefabricated modular housing system. Every tiny home is going to have transitional housing programs. For one veteran, it's a self-contained uh, unit that includes a kitchen, uh, a living room, a bathroom, and a sleeping area. Uh, speaker, this is an exciting Response. project as we support our veterans, and I'll have more to say in the uh, supplementary. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you uh, to the Minister for his response. Ontario owes a debt of gratitude to our veteran Speaker, and our government believes that everyone, especially those whose lives have been in the service of others, should have a place to call home. Speaker, as the Minister mentioned, he made a Minister zoning owner on this site. Could the Minister please tell us more about how he was able to use this tool? to help move this project forward. Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I, I certainly want to echo uh, the words of the member for Whitby. These men and women were there when we needed them, and now it's uh, our turn to provide the support that they need. Um, to speed up the process, the member is correct. I uh, issued a minister zoning order on November 10th uh, to help move this project forward. The MZO will allow for residential and complementary uses, such as the use of a community hall on the site, which is going to serve as a resource centre and be available for the uh, veterans' tenants for social gatherings and, and very important peer-to-peer -peer support. Without this MZO speaker, it would take years for this site to be rezoned through the zoning bylaw amendment process and for the construction of the Veterans Village to begin. Uh, speaker, the CEO commented that uh, in all the projects that he's worked on, this project in Kingston has moved forward the fastest. Our government is getting shovels in Bonds. the ground uh, to help uh, these veterans uh, have a better and brighter future and to provide this wonderful uh, project for them. So thank you again for the question. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. People in downtown Toronto who live on social assistance feel forgotten by this government. I recently heard from a constituent named Callie who, has, uh, who lives on ODSP and has been struggling with food insecurity for years. Callie is pre-diabetic and requires a special diet, but ODSP's special diet allowance isn't keeping pace with the skyrocketing price of food in our community. She doesn't understand why this government refuses to increase social assistance rates to keep pace with the cost of living in Ontario. Premier, why is your government refusing to help people like Callie in my community who are struggling to afford the bare necessities like food and rent? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that important question. In fact, our government has increased uh, the funding for OW and ODSP. We have added $1 billion for social services relief funding during a very, very difficult time, and we understand the challenges related to that. Uh, this service program has had challenges, and we acknowledge that, and we are the, the, really the first government to address this not only during uh, a 100-year pandemic with COVID-19 supports, but also ongoing supports. We know that uh, the food security is a very important issue, and we've added funding for that and more services for that. So this is an ongoing issue. We are uh, really putting at the centre of everything we do, the vulnerable populations that we serve, to get them the vital social services that they need. Uh, we are putting people at the centre of our transformation, uh, and this is something that we will continue to do, put the Bonds. dollars where they need to be uh, to support our vulnerable populations. Thank you. Question. Speaker, respectfully back to the minister, $100 a month that was a temporary increase to ODSP and OW during COVID, a temporary increase, is not a permanent increase to social assistance rates that are going to allow people long term to afford the cost of food in our community. Speaker, it's not news that social assistance rates have been criminally low in this province for decades. Let's not forget it was a former Conservative Premier, Mike Harris, that slashed social assistance rates in half in the mid-90s. Speaker, my family lived on social assistance in the mid-90s. I remember those cuts, and it was devastating. I knew hunger as a child because of the former Conservative government, and things have not gotten better for constituents like Callie in my community because the 15 years that the Liberals had 
had after them. They did nothing. They sat on their hands. They did not raise the rates, the rates and they let constituents like Cali continue to suffer. So my question back to the Premier is yes or no, will you permanently increase the rates of OW and ODSP Austin. today so that constituents like Cali can afford to eat? Mr. Children, Committee and Social Service. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And again, this is such an important area, and that's why our government is supporting our most vulnerable populations. And, and in fact, if we look at not only the billion dollars with the SSRF, but the increase that when we, when we first started, uh, the, we have looked at the food security issue, um, the food bank support, uh, $750,000, which we, um, million dollars, which we uh, Sorry, $750 million, which we upped to $1 billion. And we acknowledge that the previous government didn't do what it needed to do. And that's why this government is. $8 million in funding for Feed Ontario, uh, distributing prepackaged hampers to support the really important work that our food banks do and the, and the volunteers there. And I, I really want to thank them as well. This is a, the student uh, nutrition programs across the province have seen increased funding so that they can continue to deliver critical services for children. We are responding to the pandemic. We are responding to the neglect by Thoughts? the previous government over many years, as, as you have mentioned, and we will continue to get the vital social services to our most vulnerable populations, as we have been doing, and we will continue to do that. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for York Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. Almost 20 months ago to this day, the Premier told us that we need two weeks to flatten the curve. Ontarians have endured a horrific 20-month period with lockdowns and school closures. They are now subjected to passports, segregation, and an atmosphere where ordinary Canadians are subjected to hate because of this government's fear-mongering. Almost 90% of us are vaccinated. But last Thursday, Dr. Juni, head of the Ontario Science Table, appeared on CTV and said that we need two weeks to flatten the curve. My question to the Minister of Health. Does she agree with the Science Table that we need two weeks to flatten the curve? And what does the Science Table's position tell us about the policy of destruction caused by this government over the last 20 months? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. And, and first, I would say that uh, we have had to take the steps that we've taken in order to protect the health and safety of the people of Ontario. This is something. This is a pandemic. This is something that happens, hopefully, only once every hundred years. We've taking a very cautious approach to easing back, to opening up our economy. That's why we've issued our recovery plan that takes a very cautious, incremental approach to make sure that we don't have to go back again. The people of Ontario cannot deal with another other lockdown both in terms of their social sense, but also our economy can't deal with another lockdown. That's why we're being very cautious and doing things in a very careful manner. We're taking the time. To, it takes two weeks to understand the effect of a change that you make. And so that is why we have to cautiously approach this. And every change that we make, make sure Response. that we allow that two weeks to take place so that we can adjust if we need to. But the last thing we want is another lockdown. We want to keep moving Ontario forward. That's what the people of Ontario Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Speaker, visiting a loved one at a hospital to give them comfort and support, to call a nurse or a doctor when the patient is in need, or pray by their bedside when they're about to pass, is a sacred right. But now several Ontario hospitals deny family members visitation because of their medical status, because they did not take medication that the government wants everyone to take. Speaker, this is cruel and inhumane. It's a new low in the never-ending series of lows and evil imposed on Ontarians, quote, for their safety. On behalf of these patients and these families, I ask the Minister of Health, will she put an end to this inhumane cruelty and prohibit hospitals from denying visitation to families and loved ones. Minister of Health. Thank you very much. Well, first, let me say to the member opposite, the hospitals are able to make their own policies. They're run by their own independent board of directors. That's not something that the Ministry of Health directs. In some cases, that's necessary, particularly, I would say, pediatric hospitals, where most of the children thus far have not been able to be vaccinated. We hope that will change soon, and we're awaiting Health Canada's response that 5- to 11-year-olds can receive the vaccine. But in terms of taking medication that people don't want to take, that's to save people's lives. 
do you, I, I don't understand why the member doesn't understand that, Speaker. This is important to protect people, to save their lives. While we still know that people who've been doubly vaccinated can still contract COVID, it's very unlikely that they will be hospitalized, and even more unlikely that they will be intensive care, and even more unlikely that they will die. We want to save people's Response. lives in Ontario. That is my responsibility as Minister of Health, and one that I'm going to continue working on. We're continuing with our last mile strategy to get every single person in Ontario that can be vaccinated, vaccinated. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Mall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Ontario benefits from having a diverse population. It provides us a unique advantage and is truly one of our province's greatest strengths. As you know, diversity has shown to increase innovation, reduce risk, and open many new opportunities for economic development and growth. Speaker, just look around. We have, and I'm proud to be what part of the most diverse caucus in this province history and proud to say that our government continues to stand up for everyone across Ontario, no matter what their background is. At the same time, Speaker, many of my constituents have expressed their concern and the need for the government to take strong actions to combat racism and hate-motivated violence in Ontario. They want a government that defends the right of everyone in Ontario to worship practice their faith, and live their lives free of fear, intimidation, question. and violence. So my question is to the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Please tell our House what this ministry is doing to address these concerns, not just for Mississauga Malton, but for all, whole Ontario. Thank you. Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for that important question and also for his tremendous work on behalf of his constituents, both here at Queen's Park and in his writing, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government believes that everyone in the province should have an opportunity to succeed in life free of any form of hate or racism, regardless of their background, regardless where they might have come from, Mr. Speaker. This is a serious issue, and we know that more work needs to be done. Our government is taking action by investing in programs and working with organizations right across our province to promote diversity and inclusion. That's why in the recent fall economic statement, our government is committing to investing over $8 million in additional new funding to combat anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and all other forms of hate Response. in our communities right across our great province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. It is imperative that we all take these issues seriously and work with the community partners to put an end to racism and hate in our communities. With prosperity in rise, more opportunities building in our province, over 291,000 jobs going unfilled, we need our diverse population serving and thriving all across Ontario. While I do appreciate Minister's answer, I'm sure you will agree, more needs to be done. So, Speaker, through you, to the Minister, what specific sports uh, can constituent in my riding take advantage of, and what has our government done to bring grassroots solution to combating racism and hate? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for that uh, question once again, Mr. Speaker. It allows me an opportunity to highlight some of the resources available to each and every Ontarian that are focused on rooting out hate and racism in our neighborhood in our communities. Through the fall economic statement, we on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, are saying yes to doubling the anti-racism, anti-hate grant from $1.6 million to $3.2 million. We're saying yes to building fully inclusive workplace with fully funded $1.5 million business resources hub to help employers, Mr. Speaker. And we're saying yes to launching a $5 million raise grant to help racialize and indigenous entrepreneurs with seed funding. We will continue to work with our community partners to eliminate racism and hate 
in our province, we on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, will continue to say yes to building an inclusive Ontario. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, I rose in this House to ask if this government would commit to a public inquiry into Ottawa's LRT and ask Ontario's Auditor General to investigate a system, Speaker, that's been plagued with problems since it started. Speaker, the LRT is derailed six times, the latest being two months ago. The LRT has now resumed partial service, but residents at home are telling me they don't feel safe and they want answers and they want accountability now. But the P3 model that built our LRT has offered no accountability for municipal leaders in Ottawa Centre, and a story today by Joanne Cianello from CBC Ottawa accounts for the fact that John Manconi, our city's former transit manager, knew that the LRT wasn't ready before it actually opened on September 14, 2019. So my question to the government this morning is very simple. Did the province know? that senior municipal transit officials in Ottawa believed our LRT system was not fit for service a month before it opened. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much for the question. And to the member opposite, I think your question would be better directed uh, to the MPP uh, of Orleans, who was actually the chair of the Transit Commission at the time. But in terms of the P3 Order. model, of the 74 projects that have reached substantial completion, 95% were completed on budget and 81% completed within three months of substantial completion. Mr. Speaker, the P3 model has been successful. It is well, uh, it is actually admired by many places in the world. They look to Ontario for leadership, for innovative solutions, and for appropriate risk transfer. Mr. Speaker, we have uh, $60 billion worth in contract value for building hospitals, building transit in the province of Ontario, and we will continue with the successful option. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. For the people watching at home, the answer to my question was no. That's right. No. The government of Ontario didn't know that Ottawa's senior transit official told the Rideau Transit uh, Commission, the private consortium, the P3 consortiums the government is pro promoting even today, that the system wasn't fit for service. That is shocking, Speaker. This is what Mr. Manconi said in an email that Joe Antionello released today. We can, uh, we can all agree, he writes, that things are not going well. The reliability of the fleet is not where it needs to be to provide dependable service. My goodness, Speaker, this was written a month before the system opened. So if the government didn't know about this, my question to them honestly through you is, are you concerned about that? the fact that you didn't know? Are you concerned about the fact that the proprietary nature of these P3 arrangements doesn't allow you the right to know, despite being a major funder of the system? Speaker, again, I've been calling for it for a year. I'm going to call for it this morning. I hope to hear a yes to this question. Are, is the government going to mandate a provincial inquiry into this? Question. Is the government going to ask the Ontario Auditor General to investigate this mess after today's disturbing revelations? Simple question, yes or no? Minister of Transportation. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. Clearly, he, just like so many Ottawa Transit riders, is incredibly frustrated by the challenges that have been plaguing the Ottawa LRT, uh, the stage one of the Ottawa LRT. And we have become, as I've said, increasingly, increasingly concerned in the city's uh, ability to deliver on this project. That's why we're looking at all options to increase the province's oversight and ensure better value for taxpayer dollars, Mr. Speaker. We're looking at all options, including a public inquiry and a review by Ontario's Auditor General. Mr. Speaker, we take this very seriously and we'll report back to the House with more when we have some more information. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Now, uh, uh, months after the federal government offered $10 a day, uh, uh, Child Care Ontario still hasn't signed an agreement. Why not? Well, listening to the minister and the prime minister, uh, there is no longer any logical justification. The conservative prime minister said, I want the same deal that Alberta and Quebec have. Who's going to tell him Alberta and Quebec don't even have the same deal? That's how out of touch the Ontario Premier is with that said deal and the file in general. The Conservative government, the same government that cut half a billion dollars from Ontario's education budget, can't figure out why it doesn't get more money than everyone else for education. Well, where's the uh, fair deal for Ontarians in its economic statement? Nowhere. Mr. Speaker, this is just plain nonsense. When is this government going to do the right thing and finally make a deal with the federal government? Uh, the Minister of Education. 
Thank you, Speaker. What is, I think, indeed complete nonsense is the 40 per cent increase that happened under the provincial Liberal watch under Kathleen Wynne and Stephen Del Duca, indefensible by any measurement, and the member opposite should not be defending the second most expensive childcare in the nation under the Liberal watch. We agree that's unacceptable. We know we can do better. The leader when expensive childcare is the New Democrats of BC. Both parties fail in this respect. This Premier is getting the job done by getting a deal in place that stands up for our interests, that increases investment, that is more flexible to support every mom and dad in this province. Not some, but all parents deserve that support. We're standing up for Ontario, and I'd ask the provincial Liberals to do the same for the people we represent. Mr. Speaker, the worst part is the Minister for, of Education and his uh, argument to uh, say that Ontario doesn't have its fair share. As the federal minister responsible has pointed out, after deducting the funds dedicated to Aboriginal communities from the total and sharing the rest among the provinces according to their population, the figures for Ontario's offer are exactly the fair share Ontario should have. In other words, the minister and his government are not even looking at the right numbers. Right in the potato patch. Shameful, but it still has the option of admitting its mistakes and making the deal. And his argument about the uh, kindergarten, frankly, the kindergarten is not a daycare. Once again, this Conservative government does, wants the federal government to pay for what is its responsibility as the provincial level. Speaker, when will this government stop uh, beating around the bush and come to an agreement with the federal government? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I've said, our government wants a fair deal, a good deal for the people of Ontario. Uh, we want the federal government to not penalize this province because we happen to have a far more superior program for four and five-year-olds. Yes, that's based within our school system, led by a teacher and an ECE, which virtually no province in Canada has. We're not asking for anything more than the recognition, like in Quebec, that has an existing system, and yet the federal government opted to provide the maximum investment with few strings attached. We want a similar program that does not penalize us for being the gold standard when it comes to care for children. We want an investment that is proportionate to our population, and we want a long-term commitment that ensures childcare prices are affordable, yes, for year one through five and well beyond, Speaker. Order. The member for Niagara Centre. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. About a year ago, the Minister issued a Minister's Zoning Order to bypass due process and public consultations and fast-track the development of Block 41 in Vaughan, an area that includes Greenbelt farmland. Most of the Block 41 landowners have strong political and donor ties to the Premier and the PC party. One of these well-connected landowners, TAC Construction, is seeking a regional official plan amendment that would allow the destruction of Greenbelt farmland as part of the Block 41 development enabled by the MZO. The minister is the final approval authority. Will he protect the Greenbelt and reject this amendment, or will he protect the profits of the Premier's developer friends and donors? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. I was asked this question on, uh, on Monday by the Toronto Star, and at that time, we had not received the documentation from York Region regarding their request. Uh, we just received it uh, yesterday. Uh, we are reviewing it. Uh, as uh, the member knows, I have 120 days uh, to make a decision. We will give it our due diligence. We'll make sure that it's a complete application, uh, and we'll provide a response. That seems fair. Mr. Niagara Centre. Speaker, this government has justified its overuse and abuse of ministers' zoning orders based on a secret Deloitte report no one can find and may not even exist. Most of the MZOs issued by this government have benefited friends and donors of the Premier, like Michael de Gasparis, who runs TAC Construction when he is not busy with Vaughan working families currently under RCMP investigation. The MZO for Block 41 led directly to TAC Construction's request for a regional official plan amendment that would allow the destruction of Greenbelt farmland. Vaughan and York staff, the Toronto Conservation Authority and the Greenbelt Foundation all oppose this amendment. The minister must choose. Will he protect the Greenbelt and reject this amendment, or will he protect the profits of the Premier's developer friends and donors? Minister of National Affairs and Housing, your call. Well, again, Speaker, I, I can't let that uh, question go by uh, without correcting the record regarding minister zoning orders. I've been very clear uh, as minister 
uh, all of the MZOs that have been requested on non-provincial land have come at the request of a municipality. So the, the municipality works with the, the applicant uh, and then makes the decision to request the minister's zoning order. And I, I have to tell you, Speaker, you know, you know, I'll just take one aspect of minister's zoning order. So in 15 years, uh, the Liberal government aided 99% of the time by New Democrats, only built Coalition 611 long-term care beds. MZOs that I've signed at the request of municipalities, we've already committed to 3,700 beds. Oh, wow. I said yes, and we're going to get shovels in the ground and build long-term care beds. Yes. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Uh, Minister, as we head into the winter season, most Ontario colleges and universities are unprepared to keep students and faculty safe in the event of a surge in COVID infection cases. By that time, vaccination immunity is projected to wane, foreseeably exposing students and faculty to mass outbreaks in crowded in-person classes. Now, in some cases, uh, colleges and universities, if they were to put something in place now ahead of time, online options for these students and faculty who wish to avoid the risk of infection this winter from in-person attendance, I would think it be prudent that preparations for remote learning and instruction would be good policy to keep everyone safe. What I'd like to know is Question. your thoughts on this issue. The Minister of Colleges and Universities to respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. As you know, having post-secondary institutions open are critical to the economic recovery of this province. In fact, we are training the professionals that we need on the front lines right now, the PSWs, the nurses. Um, In-person training is important. As well, we've seen the, um, the need for uh, mental health, so it's really important to have students back in the classroom. And I'm actually very proud of our sector. In fact, 94% of students have been double vaxxed, as well as 93.3% of staff and faculty. So we are above the provincial average. That these young people are protected. It's important that they are back in the classroom. And um, you know the, the fact that the, I worked with the Chief Medical Officer of Health to ensure that colleges and universities are following the protocol to get students back in the classroom, and we'll continue to work with the sector to make sure that students are able to return to the classroom safely. The supplementary. I thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Yeah, to be very clear, my question was about compelling students and faculty, whether vaccinated or unvaccinated, to attend in-person classes this coming semester at a time when the pandemic emergency still remains a live concern. Minister, what if some students and faculty catch COVID next semester? What if others wish to avoid the risk of infection by learning remotely? From a health perspective, do you agree that it would be smart policy for Ontario colleges and universities to have in place remote learning and instruction options for all in-person classes in order to keep students and faculty safe? And Speaker, Ontario students, faculty, and parents are looking to this minister for a straight answer. Mr. Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. In fact, we provide the COVID supports for students and for institutions to uh, protect the students. And we also I thank the, the uh, sector for switching to virtual learning as quickly as they did to ensure the safety of the staff and the students um, in place. We have a partnership with eCampus Ontario that worked on digital learning and the supports to colleges and universities at that time. And we also launched our virtual learning strategy to improve the quality and learning experience for post-secondary students. But if you look at this sector, as I said, we're above the provincial average. There is a vaccine policy in place at institutions across the province to ensure that faculty, staff, and students are kept safe. And I thank the sector for this work and the work that we've been doing with the Chief Medical Officer of Health. And look, as I said before, this is a crucial Response. sector. We need to ensure that we are providing the frontline workers with the education that they need, the nurses, the doctors, the, the PSWs, to ensure the health of all Ontarians. Next question, member for Thunder Bay, Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, 
Right now, the opioid-related morbidity and mortality rates in Thunder Bay District Health Unit are 10 times higher than anywhere else in the province. The St. Joseph's Healthcare Group runs the Balmoral Treatment Centre that provides withdrawal management services, the first step in getting people help. There have been approximately 3,000 admissions every year since 2017, but another 3,000 admissions are denied every year because every bed is in use. Our community desperately needs the province to step up. Premier, will this government commit to funding a community-based crisis centre in Thunder Bay? And the response, the Associate Minister for Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member opposite for that question. Mr. Speaker, no matter where you live in the province of Ontario, it's always been our mission that all Ontarians have access to high-quality mental health and addiction supports when and where they need them. From the very beginning, our government has taken decisive action to address the mental health and addictions needs across the province, including in northern, rural, and remote communities. Mm -hmm. This is a problem that is facing all of the province of Ontario. And since the release of the Roadmap to Wellness, Mr. Speaker, we've made unprecedented investments, totaling over $40 million in new, ongoing, annualized funding, specifically to address the needs of those living with mental health and addictions challenges in Northern Ontario. And these investments include new funding for inpatient mental health beds, mobile crisis services, both in-home and mobile detox services, and opioid addiction services in Timmins, child and youth what? mental health supports and residential detox services in Thunder Bay, peer support, mobile crisis teams, and safe beds for mobile crisis services. In the supplementary question. Thank you. My question then is to the minister. Uh, Thunder Bay needs a community-based crisis centre, and over 30 healthcare and non-profit community partners have come together in Thunder Bay to support one, including our police. Our residents deserve a facility that is local and provides one-stop shop of care. We're not doing enough. The opioid crisis demands a better response from this government. Minister, when can Thunder Bay expect this government to provide the new crisis centre for our community? And the Associate Minister, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, as the member opposite should know, we've invested over $525 million now and will continue investing $525 million to build a system throughout the province of Ontario. But Mr. Speaker, what I'd like to point out to the party opposite is to not forget the fact that when the NDP were in charge, they voted no to more mental health beds. Shame. In fact, they closed 13 percent of Ontario's mental health beds and closed 9,645 hospital beds throughout the, the, the entire province. And, Mr. Speaker, they said no to more acute care, mental health care, and cut $53 million from several of Ontario's psychiatric hospitals. In addition to that, they voted no and cut health care funding across the board in their last budget when they reduced cap hospital funding by 1%. Mr. Mr. Speaker, it's our government that is building the system in the province of Ontario and cleaning up the mess that was made by the NDP and continued under the Liberal government. Here, here. Through our historic Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 101C, changes have been made to the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business, such that Ms. Bell assumes ballot item number 14 and Mr. Glover assumes ballot item number 66. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.